Welcome to American Methods. Yeah, we have started a new chapter on American Monte Carlo and the valuation of Bermudan options. And well, for the valuation of the Bermudan option, we discussed a few aspects, yeah, some different formulation, like using the optimal exercise time. And all these things boiled a little down, bit down to estimating a conditional expectation. So American Monte Carlo is essentially or to estimate the conditional expectation operator in the Monte Carlo simulation. So for our application, the Bermudan options, the valuation of the Bermudan options, we have the very nice backward algorithm. So which is here. So we initialize a random variable to zero, and then we update this random variable by going backward in time. And on each time step, we have to take the conditional expectation of that random variable, compare it to our underlying in which we are allowed to exercise. And yeah, if the value of the underlying is larger, then we exercise into the underlying value. Otherwise, we just retain this random variable. So this is then our UI plus one, which we retain. And this decision is done on every path and then defines the new, the random variable at the new time step. So you see that the essential task here is to estimate the conditional expectation operator. Yeah, and we discussed several ways to do this. So this simulation would be that we have here our Monte Carlo simulation. So maybe here's the time at which we would like to estimate this conditional expectation operator. So this is our Monte Carlo simulation. And what we would do at this condition time is to just start another Monte Carlo simulation to estimate the conditional expectation. Yeah? So for example, here, also you start another Monte Carlo simulation. So this re-simulation looks like that. Huh? You start a Monte Carlo within a Monte Carlo. It is a nice idea to get an intuition, but it's not feasible yeah, because of the effort grows exponentially. So the next thing we thought is, yeah, just take the sample path that we already have in our Monte Carlo simulation. So if this is your Monte Carlo simulation, then your re-simulation just consists of exactly that single sample path that you observe. Yeah? So you just take the sample path that you have in your, that single sample path in your simulation as an estimate for your conditional expectation. Well, if you think back to re-simulation, this means that you do a Monte Carlo simulation with a single, single sample path that has a huge Monte Carlo error. You already see the issue here that this approximation is not FT1 measurable, but the conditional expectation conditional to FT1 is FT1 measurable. Yeah, so you have information about the future. And we had a small computer experiment And you see if you use this perfect foresight as an estimate for the conditional expectation, you get a much higher value for the Bermudan option because you know what happens in the future. You can 
exercise super optimal. Yeah? So here in this case, we know an estimate for the conditional expectation because it was Black Schultz model, in which case the Black Schultz formula is the conditional expectation. Okay, so that was perfect foresight. And then we made another step by actually realizing that our conditional expectation conditional to some field from the filtration. So the FT1 conditional to time T1. Well, this could be also interpreted as a conditional expectation with respect to some random variable. So here our sigma field FT1 we can think of it as being some random variable set. So the random variable set generates the FT1 or yeah, even more general, in some cases you can find um, a smaller yeah, sigma field generated by Z such that this identity holds yeah? because it depends a little bit on which does this quantity here uh, depend. Yeah? So does it only depend on a single random variable or does it depend on say the whole history of events yeah, that evolved up to FT1? For our little example of the Bermudan option uh, with an European underlying, we know that the Conditional expectation just depends on the initial value. So it's just the stock at time T1 that is relevant and not how we reach this point. No? So it's a single random variable S of T1 uh, on which we could uh, condition. So assume that you have this with random variable Z. Yeah, then you can interpret the conditional expectation as a functional dependence, yeah? You just replace here the set. Conditional expectation is a random variable. So if that random variable is evaluated on omega, this means that you are checking, has this set a specific value, yeah? Namely, Z of that omega. Okay, so if this Z of that omega, so if this guy is now here, my little Z, then this is a function of Z. So in our little picture, we just look at what is the value of the stock at time T1. Yeah? And this defines actually my condition. Yeah? So this here is then my random variable z, the value of the stock at time t1. And this observation, yeah, that we can maybe find some random variable that represents our condition, uh, this led to the idea that we have maybe a nice method for estimating the conditional expectation. An example where the Z is not just a single random variable, like for example, the stock, and maybe also a quite general example, is if you think of your model being generated by an Euler scheme. So your model is just a collection of random variables. Your stochastic process is just a collection of random variables. It's a, it's a time discrete stochastic process. And then you see that all the information you have up to time ti is which Brownian increment was used to up to the, up to that time point capital ti so capital ti is my condition time and if you have a time discretization now from t0 up to tm tm being the capital T1. Yeah, then all these little steps you do, they contain all the information. Yeah, So they form the sigma field 
FT1. They contain all the information you have up to time T1. So in that case, your random variable Z is actually just the vector of these uh, Brownian increments. Yeah? So your model parameters given, the values of this vector define what path you have followed up to that time t1. So you can identify the conditional expectation, conditional f t1 with conditional expectation, conditional z, yeah? so conditional that this path has been followed. So this um, view, interpreting now here the conditional expectation as some functional dependence is valuable in theory, but if you look again here, you see that there is just a single path that has this value, little z, yeah? So this here is maybe your value little z, okay? So if this is the little z, then there's just a single sample path in my whole simulation, yeah? So conditioning to, conditioning to Z, capital Z being that little Z, is actually just conditioning to that single sample path. So it would be like perfect foresight. So it is not feasible. But now we had an idea, and this was then the next step. We could define some neighborhoods around these Z. So there are more than just one sample pass passing through this neighborhood and average over these sample paths. So this is the idea of binning. So we take some bin. So my bin is now some epsilon neighborhood around the little Z, the capital Z of omega of the sample pass on which I am, and I approximate now the conditional expectation, conditional that capital Z has the value Z of omega. I approximate this now by some value HI, where HI is the average over that bin, yeah, the conditional expectation over that bin, this is my hi. So it's this picture that we have, okay, you use all those sample paths, passing through this little bin to calculate the conditional expectation. This is the conditional expectation you assign to all the sample paths that have reached this bin. This is for the example yeah, where my Z is just the value of the stock at time T1. Yeah? If it is a vector, yeah, you have neighborhoods in you know, some higher dimensional space. Here it's just a neighborhood on a one dimensional space. Okay, so you see this concept of the bin becomes complicated yeah, if you have the random variable Z that describes the sigma field FT1. If that random variable is not just a scalar, if it is a vector, then of course your neighborhoods uh, are neighborhoods in this vector space. Then this concept of binning becomes a little bit more complicated, but it's a nice um, idea. And maybe we can look what a computer program will generate if we use binning. I will not explain the computer program to you now. We will have that a bit later, but we can maybe look at the picture generated by that. Here in our experiment repository, uh, uh, asset valuation products, there is an Bermudan option experiment. And there I make experiments with different approximation methods and maybe I just use binning with 20 bins. Um, the model is a Black-Scholes model. Yeah. 
and the option is running to five years. So the option I'm valuing is a Bermudan option that has exercise in year two and exercise in year five. The strikes are a little bit different. You have to um, distribute a little bit evenly the exercise probabilities. Maybe I just run this little program and now just for the case with the binning, so with 40% probability, we exercise in time T1 being equal two years. And with 13% probability, we exercise in time T2 being five years. And with 46% uh, probability, we don't exercise at all. Yeah, so we take zero. So this is the picture that we get with now binning. So what you see is 20 bins. Okay, and you see that the conditional expectation that I would like to approximate, in the, in the case of the Plex-Scholz model, I know it analytically, it's the Plex-Scholz formula with the remaining time. This is here, this green line. Yeah? This green line is the true conditional expectation. So this is conditional to F T1. And the blue lines, yeah, so actually all these guys are dots, yeah, because they are random variables in the Monte Carlo simulation sample points. The blue lines are my estimate. Of the conditional expectation using binning. And the bins are actually chosen such that you have, yeah, in every bin, almost the same number of points. That's why, for example, this interval here, this bin is a bit larger than that bin. Okay, so you see here these dots. These dots, yeah, they are the sample values if you continue, yeah, your continuation value. And these the average of these dots in this interval here, yeah, so now averaging all the values, yeah, so here the values you observe, all of these values of these dots averaging them, this gives you this expectation here, and this is the uh, value that you use for the conditional expectation. So you see, for this case, you would sometimes exercise, yeah? the, the red line is the value of the underlying, which I now compare to analytically the green line. In that case, you would always exercise into the red line if you are after that point. So that point here is your exercise boundary where actually the green line and the red line intersect. This is the analytic exercise boundary. But you see for binning, sometimes there is a little bit yeah, noise, yeah, a little bit mixture, because if you now compare the red line and the blue line, it would mean that here you would continue while here you are with the red line above, yeah, you would exercise. So you see with spinning, you get some large decision errors because analytically in this region, you would always exercise because the red line is above the green line. Okay, you see that binning does yeah, a fairly good job here in this region. Yeah, You see that I have here these piecewise constant guys. So you see I have here these piecewise constant guys that 
wiggle a little bit around the green line. Yeah, you could say it is a piecewise constant approximation of the green line with some noisy errors. And these noisy errors, they come, of course, from the fact that we have only few points in each bin. Yeah? Each bin is a Monte Carlo simulation with a smaller amount of points. If I have 20 bins, it's actually the total number of sample paths divided by 20 that he goes here in each, each bin. Okay, and now let's continue and derive an alternative interpretation or an alternative formulation of what we are doing. And in my explanation, it was already contained. So what we are doing is I approximate the green line by a piecewise constant function. And you can interpret the binning as a least square regression on the set of piecewise constant functions. So let's consider our binning again. So what we have is we have this value hi, you know, that was our horizontal line. And this is the Monte Carlo expectation, Monte Carlo approximation of the expectation all sample paths yeah, for which my random variable z falls into the bin ui. Okay, so the bin uis are just predefined a partitioning yeah, of your image space of the random variable z. So what I have there is an expectation and there is an alternative characterization of what an expectation is. The, if you have a random variable, say x, the expectation of x is the value such that x minus that value has the smallest L2 now. So the expectation of a given random variable, say x, This guy is a number h such that x minus h has the smallest L2 norm. Okay, so you can see this immediately. Yeah, Just calculate this L2 norm squared. Yeah? So calculate the variance. So the variance is expectation of x minus h squared. This is equal, yeah. So this is now actually a bilinear operator. You could also say it's the uh, it's x minus h times x minus h. So this is the expectation of x squared minus two times the expectation of x times h. You can move the h outside because that's a constant plus h squared. And now if you would like to minimize this function, so this is a function of h. So if I would like to minimize this, I would like to find now h such that expectation x minus h squared is minimal. So you take the first derivative, so the first derivative, so the first derivative of this yellow part here, this is minus two times expectation of x plus two times h. Okay, so in, if that has to be equal to zero, so you see the h is the expectation of x. So I have a very nice interpretation for the expectation. And actually this result here, this holds also for the conditional expectation. So if you go back to the binning, yeah, so you see we are taking here the expectation on a subset of our sample path. Yeah? So just apply now this lemma on that subset and you have the result also for the condition expectation, I would like to find the number h in my binning 
I would like to find the horizontal value, hi, such that all these other dots minus this horizontal value has minimal L2 norm. So if you go back to our computer program, this horizontal line here is characterized by, it's placed at the level where all these dots that you see here, the dots that fall into this bin, minus this level, minimizes the L2 norm, yeah, minimizes the sum of the squared. So I can rewrite this. My value hi is actually characterized by consider all values g and take that value g that minimizes the expectation of the gray dots that you observe. So these are the gray dots that you observe minus g squared. Well, condition to my bin, yeah? So actually on the set, z is in ui. So this is a characterization of this value um, hi now using this lemma. So now you have that all these bins are disjoint. So my bin ui, this is disjoint. So this means that each individual minimization problem here is independent, yeah? So finding the best level in this bin, yeah? is independent actually from finding the best level in this bin. So instead of finding the individual HIs, you can also just minimize the sum over those squared sums and find the optimal vector HI. So H1 for bin one, H2 for bin two. So all these guys for every bin. So find this optimal vector. So by taking the minimum over all possible such vectors G, yeah, all possible G I in R, taking the sum over the continuation values, these are our continuation values, minus the G I's, yeah, conditional that we are in this bin. Okay, so what are we doing actually here? What are we doing here? So we are considering a piecewise constant function. So this GI is a piecewise constant function, and HI is the optimal piecewise constant function. So from the set of all such piecewise constant functions, such that this expression here is minimal. So I could introduce, instead of saying I have bins ui, yeah, u1, u2, and so on, I could introduce a function space, the space of all piecewise constant functions, constant on those bins. And then I say, what I'm looking for is the piecewise constant function that minimizes this expression here, yeah? Minimizes the distance to the gray dots, to the continuation values in the L2 norm. Okay, so now I have make this, made this a little bit more complicated, yeah? So this is often the case that you do some stuff and you make it a little bit more complicated. But in the end, what we have done here is we have generalized this. So H is now my function space H maps from omega, you know, say um, a sample pass to R. And this function space is defined as being piecewise constant. So the function should be constant on each bin. And then my conditional expectation, this guy is just a member of this function space, okay? 
And this member yeah, is, okay, this is my H of omega is HI if the omega falls into the pin UI. Okay, then my problem is equivalent to find, find this function H such that we it minimizes the L2 distance yeah, among all those functions. So binning is just a regression. Yeah? So this is just a, an L2 regression, find the smallest distance. Yeah? So binning is just an L2 regression on the space of functions piecewise constant functions, the space of functions that are constant on these pins. Okay, if we're going back to our little computer experiment, okay, now you see it clearly. Yeah. So instead of calculating all these levels, yeah, this is just approximate the green line by a piecewise constant function. And the piecewise constant function is defined as minimizing the L2 distance to the Quay dots in this picture. And now with this idea in mind, you immediately have a much better method because in this picture, well, I would like to have an approximation of the green line. Why not just take a smoother function space? Hmm? Take a linear function yeah, that has the minimum L2 distance yeah? or take a polynomial yeah? alpha 0 plus alpha 1 times s yeah? so my it, it is a function of s times alpha 2 s squared yeah? so s of t1 squared so it's a function of s of t1 it's a function of that random variable so find a quadratic function that runs through that maybe that's much better because we are only interested in this intersection point. Yeah? So we are not so interested in what happens outside. Yeah? We are interested in finding a good approximation for this intersection point. Of course, the function should not run like that. So we have a nice generalization of our idea because we observe that binning can be interpreted as this the regression and now I just generalize here this function space. Yeah? This function space can be something better, yeah, something smoother. Okay, so we arrived now at the regression method, yeah, the least square Monte Carlo method, it's sometimes called. So we approximate now the conditional expectation on some function space with a least square approximation. And this is a very, very popular method. So this is actually the method to estimate the conditional expectation in a Monte Carlo. There are a lot of improvements, yeah, a lot of differences by, for example, yeah, which regression method do you use? Yeah, there are different regression methods, linear regression, lasso, whatever. Okay, so the partition of our state space into a finite number of bins. So the image space of our random variable Z. So this results in a piecewise constant approximation of the conditional expectation. And an obvious improvement would be to use maybe some smooth function of our random variable z. So this is our function f of z, which I had previously on the slide. Yeah? So I have some smooth function f of z and still take the same criteria, the same characterization of conditional expectation, yeah, of expectation, it's minimizing this distance. So let us start with a fairly general definition of this approximation. Okay, so this is here. So u is the random variable. Yeah, so these are then my continuation values. Yeah, the random variables 
which are in the future, of which I would like to take the conditional expectation to time T1. And let's say the conditional expectation is given by V. Yeah, so V is FT1 measurable. And now I have to describe which random variables contain the information of my sigma field FT1. So this is my Z yeah, from the previous slides. So here I call it Y. So this is the vector of so-called basis functions. Yeah, later we will call it, ba call it basis function. So this is a vector of FT1 measurable random variables which represents the information I have up to time T1. Could be all your Brownian increments, or could be in your example with the Black-Schultz model, just the value of the stock at time T1. Yeah? If that is enough to describe the condition expectation. Then I have a function, a function F. So this is now a function from RP, so this is the number of predictors yeah, of Ys we have, and of RQ. So this will be some parameter which we will then optimize. Yeah. Okay, so this function is given. So then find the optimal parameter alpha star alpha star being a vector alpha 1 to alpha q so the second argument of my function such that u minus the function f applied to my predictor random variables y with that parameter alpha, this minimizes our L2 distance among all such random variables, yeah? so among all those f of y and alpha. So for the intuition, the y's in the binning, they would be the indicator functions of each bin. And the alpha is just the value hi. Yeah? It's just the level that you have. And the f is ju then just the sum alpha i yi. So well, that would be our last example. So you see, this here is a little bit more general. Yeah, My function space is parameterized by here the alpha. So this is here my function space h. And in this function space, I now you search for the optimal function. Yeah, I'm searching here for the optimal. I'm searching here for the optimal alpha alpha star. A remark: Since this is a function of random variables y, where the random variables y are ft1 measurable. I'm looking to approximate this with an FT1 measurable random variable. So this is the conditional, expectational, conditional FT1. If I have found this minimizing alpha star, then I just call this guy my, whoops. I just call this guy my, I just call this guy my, least square approximation uh, of the random variable V of the original condition expectation. Okay, so I just call it now the least square approximation. Well, this is a definition. Shouldn't it be maybe a lemma or theorem? Okay, what we know is if this here is the space of all FT1 measurable random variables, then 
this guy here is the conditional expectation because the conditional expectation is the random variable that minimizes this norm. Okay, but uh, the space could be much smaller. Uh, actually, I just have a parameterization with alpha. Uh, so it's just an approximation because we could miss um, a lot of information. So I already gave you the example how the F the y and the alpha look in the case of binning. So if the number of parameters and the number of random variables match, so if the p is equal to the q, and your function f of the predictor random variables y1 to yp and your parameters, yeah, if that function is just the sum alpha i, yi, then we have a linear regression. Okay, so we have a linear function of the random variables y, and we would find like to find the best fitting linear function of the uh, random variables y, the best fitting ones that minimize the distance to our given random variable u. Yeah. The random variable u being maybe ft2 or f whatever um, measurable, the random variable y is ft1 measurable. So the best fitting ft1 measurable linear function in y that is the closest to the random variable u. Going back to our picture, uh, if it's just a linear function, okay, that looks like a big restriction. You maybe think, okay, I'm just approximating now here through this cloud with a linear function instead of a piecewise constant function. Yeah, okay, no, that's not true because the random variables y, you can choose them. And the random variables y, they could be, for example, the constant. Okay, approximate with a constant find the constant value yeah, that is minimizing this distance. Actually, this constant value is the average of all the values you observe in this cloud of dots. Yeah? So I hope you see that uh, they are small gray dots here in this picture. You could say it's, uh, it's just uh, the value s, the random variable is just the value s, then it's a linear function going through this. Yeah? alpha being the slope, but you could also have two such random variables, the constant plus the linear one, or you could have also S squared. One of these Y's could be just S squared. So you have, for example, Y1 is the constant one, Y2 is the random variable S of T1, Y3 is the random variable S of T1 squared, which means that you can construct with the linear regression the approximation by a polynomial. Yeah? So that it is called linear regression means it is linear in the basis functions, but the basis functions could be monomials yeah? such that you can build a polynomial. So in this special case, yeah, uh, yeah you've, you've, this is actually the stuff that is discussed in many papers we find that we have actually a linear regression and the linear regression has a nice property. I can analytically tell you what is the optimal alpha star. So we are looking for the optimal alpha star and the alpha star is the solution of this matrix vector equation. X transposed X times alpha star is equal X transposed U where, okay, the X is the matrix formed by your basis functions Y, yeah, column by column. So these are your basis functions Y, Y1, Y2, up to YP, evaluated on every sample path. Yeah? Note here we have the sample path Omega. So the matrix X has many rows. Yeah, for every sample path, I have a row. 
a few columns, yeah, depending on how many basis functions you use. If you use spinnings, it's 20 columns if you have 20 bins. And then I form the X transpose X. And on the other side, I have X transpose times U. And the U is actually the vector having as many entries as you have sample paths of the random variable of which you would like to approximate the conditional expectation. So I would like to take the conditional expectation of U. And that guy is approximated with my F of Y and alpha. If you can take the inverse of X transposed X, then you have the alpha star explicitly. The alpha star is X transposed X inverse times X transposed U. So this looks as if you have to do huge matrix multiplications, but note here, the X transposed X inverse, this is an P times number of sample path matrix multiplied with a number of sample path matrix times P. So this is a P times P matrix. So this is a small matrix. If you just have five basis functions, say a polynomial up to order four, one S, S squared, S3, S4, five basis functions. And this is a five by five matrix, which you have to invert. So this inversion here is not very expensive. And what you have here, so this is the P times N path matrix multiplied with an N path vector, uh, so n pass times one. So this is a p vector. So you have p times p matrix times the p vector gives you that p vector, which is your alpha star, the solution uh, of this minimization problem. And then taking alpha star times y, uh, so the sum alpha i, y i, you have your conditional expectation estimator because it is just an estimate. Okay, so this is a lemma. Yeah, So I'm actually claiming that this is the solution. Yeah, This is the guy, yeah, this alpha star, which is, which is here. So any alpha star solving this equation, if x transposed x is invertible, then the alpha star given here, any such alpha star solving this equation is actually minimizing this, this distance. Yeah, let's prove that. So in case where we have that our F is given in this special form, so a linear combination of my basis functions, I would like to minimize the function g of alpha, g of alpha is my u minus f of alpha in the L2 norm. Yeah, minimizing the L2 norm, I could also just minimize g of alpha being L2 norm squared. Then I can write this as the vector u. Yeah, so by the way, here is L2 norm on omega star. Omega star is now my my sample space, my Monte Carlo sample space. So the Monte Carlo sample path I have in my Monte Carlo simulation. So this means I look at this minimization of these random variables only on my sample space. Therefore, I can replace the capital U with the little u, the little u being my sample vector. And I can replace my f of y and alpha. I can replace that 
guy with the x times alpha. So alpha uh, x has p columns. Yeah, alpha is a p vector. So row times column. Yeah, this gives an entry. And how many rows I have? Number of sample paths. Yeah. So this here is a number of sample paths vector of the x times alpha. So this this is norm squared. So actually I have u minus x times alpha transposed multiplied with u minus x times alpha. This should be minimized. Yeah, differentiate with respect to alpha. You see that you get minus two times x transposed times u minus x times alpha. Okay, multiply the x transposed to the u and to the x times alpha. And you see that you have minus two x transposed u minus x transposed x alpha. And that should be equal to zero. Yeah, because I would like to, to minimize it. And you get our equation that has to be solved by the alpha. So the alpha that solves this equation is minimizing this uh, function. Yeah? So it's minimizing this norm. So small remark maybe. If I have found the alpha star, so I have found this alpha star. If the x transposed x is invertible, then the alpha star is x transposed x inverse, yeah, my p times p matrix times x transposed u. Okay, that is my alpha star. If I found this alpha star, then my least square approximation of the condition expectation, yeah, so my condition expectation of u, ft1 hmm, approximation, this is then just the f of y with that alpha star, which means this is just the x times alpha star. Uh, so as I mentioned, row times column, yeah, this is an n pass sample vector. And then if you plug this in, you have the expression that the condition expectation is x times x transposed x inverse times x transposed u. So what is going on here? This is the guy of which you would like to have the condition expectation. This is a projection on your basis function space. And this is then blowing this up. Yeah. So this is the projection in terms of the basis function parameters. And this is this representing it in this basis, yeah? So this is actually just the projection on the basis function space where this guy here is just renormalizing, yeah? Because, of course, if you have five times the basis function, the result should be the same, yeah? Your alpha i is then one divided by five, the previous alpha i. Yeah? So this is just doing some kind of renormalization. There is a very nice interpretation of this result if you think back for uh, to the example of the binning, which motivated this idea here. Small remark, these guys, the y1 to yp, they are called basis functions, explanatory variables, predictors, Yeah, the guy that predict the values. Now, there are different names for these. I can now use this in my backward algorithm. So here in the script, you have now a complete example how we would e evaluate a Bermudan option on the stock with this algorithm. So assume you have the Bermudan option where every underlying has this European-like payoff, stock at time ti minus a strike, strike ki may be multiplied with a constant notional, yeah, multiplied with ni, then we use our backward algorithm to derive the optimal exercise strategy. First step, initialize your random variable. 
u to zero, so the end value, so you don't exercise, and then we go step by step. Backward, so backward algorithm means that we go now backward over time here. You calculate the underlying value. Okay, so this is your payoff if you would exercise in time ti, and you compare this with the conditional expectation the condition expectation operator applied to your random variable u. This is just the backward algorithm. How do I approximate this conditional expectation? I approximate this by calculating now this v hold. Yeah, so I'm I'm not exercising. I'm holding the option right. So I continue, and I'm calculating this with the formula we have x times x transposed x inverse times x transposed applied to the random variable of which I would like to calculate the conditional expectation. So applied to my ui plus one. So this variable is now compared to my underlying. So that was the green guy from the previous slide. So if this is smaller, this estimate is smaller, then I take the underlying. Otherwise, I do not take the ex uh, estimate. I take the continuation value. Yeah, I just continue. And that was the improvement of the um, backward algorithm. Yeah, So that you have here this dark blue guy, the continuation value. Uh, and you do not take the, the estimate. And this defines then the continuation value of for the next time step. So very nice, yeah. My backward algorithm just has a single additional step. And this additional step is here, this regression or this small matrix multiplication exercise you know, to get the estimate. So this is just the backward algorithm with a specific underlying and our regression estimator for the conditional expectation. Okay, so you have a few examples in the script. But instead of looking just at the examples in the script, maybe you could look into some code. Before we do this, let me come back to the binning and now reinterpret the binning as the special choice of the basis functions. I already mentioned this. So binning is just now having the indicator functions as basis functions. So your bin is maybe here uj, and then for the bin uj, you, uh, you define your random variable yj as being the indicator function on this bin. So we have a specific set of basis function, namely the, namely the indicator functions on the bins. So a piecewise constant functions on the bins uj is a linear combination of the corresponding indicator functions. These indicator functions are now our base functions. With this definition, let us maybe reinterpret the matrix X and the stuff that we do here, yeah? What is X transposed X inverse? And what is X transposed U? What is this in this case? So for this choice, you see that X transposed X inverse, yeah, X transposed X. If X is the matrix where every column is an indicator function, whether I am on bin one, two and three. This means because the bins are disjoint, yi multiplied with yj is zero if y is not equal to j. Because you have entries one, 
at different locations. So X transpose X is a diagonal matrix. And on the diagonal, you have YI multiplied with YI. And this is just one multiplied with one plus zero multiplied with zero and so on. So you just count the number of entries where the indicator function is one. So what we have is that X transpose X, this is just the diagonal matrix where the diagonal elements, the MJ, this is the number of sample paths that pass through that bin. Yeah? That pass to the bin UJ. So this means the X transpose X inverse is just, yeah, it's just a diagonal matrix with one divided by this number. If X transpose is this indicator function, yeah, so X is a, the indicator function in a column, X transpose is the indicator function in a row, X transpose times U, this is just some all values that fall in the bin. Yeah? It's just one multiplied with u something, zero multiplied with u something if the u uh, if the sample pass is not in that bin. It's just take the sum over all values u. And you see indeed that the x transposed x inverse is just the renormalization. It's divide by the number of values that fall into this bin. And you see that the alpha j is just the average yeah, of the values you observe in this bin. So your alpha j in binning, interpreted here as a linear regression with indicator function as basis functions, is truly just the expectation in a bin. And then your conditional expectation estimator yeah, this guy is the X multiplied with the alpha star. Okay. The X is now all these indicator functions. So you just have a row where there is a one in one position, namely in that bin. So this just means take the alpha J for the corresponding bin and assign it to the sample pass. So maybe that's a, a nice interpretation. And now you know why this ch looks like that. Yeah, okay. Also, uh, because this code uh, that I'm using, this is just a, the regression code with a different set of basis functions. So we, before we come to our code session, yeah, where we look at the code that have generated the picture that we have already seen and that implements now both things, the backward algorithm and the regression estimation for the condition expectation. Let me make two small comments. What we get with our least square approximation for the conditional expectation operator, what we get is actually a lower bound for the Bermudan option value. So this will result in a lower bound. Okay, so why is this? The thing is that in my backward algorithm, I use now my conditional expectation estimator to make the decision. And the optimal decision is if I use the exact correct conditional expectation. So that is the best possible, say, if I decide in time t1, ft1 measurable random variable that I could do. Huh? This is the optimal decision. Any other random variable will lead to a suboptimal decision. Yeah, So I make some mistakes. So the random variable that I have here is ft1 measurable. Why? Okay, because all my basis functions they are FT1 measurable, just a function of those. And the optimal exercise strategy, this is maximizing the Bermudan 
value. So among all FT1 measurable exercise strategies. So using any other one that is not exactly the, the right one would get a lower value. So I have a lower bound. Yeah? So maybe my bound is sharp. Yeah, maybe I get the ex uh, best value, but I cannot expect that I have an upper, upper bound. This is not completely true because this guy here is a Monte Carlo approximation. So there is still a Monte Carlo error. So I have a lower bound in the limit case where I interpret this here as being the random variable on the full space yeah? and where I interpret this here as being the mathematical, the analytical conditional expectation operator, then the statement is true, then I have a lower bound. If I have now a Monte Carlo error in my estimate, then this in introduces some foresight bias. So this is like the perfect foresight. And the reason is that, yeah, just look what happens. If you have a Monte Carlo simulation, and say this is here your Monte Carlo simulation going like that. And you maybe you know that there is some sample bias. For example, maybe I just remove a few paths here. My Monte Carlo simulation is, let's say, a little bit imperfect that there is some kind of bias, okay. So if you now estimate the conditional expectation here, and there's some kind of bias that these sample paths are maybe higher, and these sample paths here have a bias low, then your conditional expectation will have this bias at the time when you make the decision T1. So your conditional expectation at that time has a bias high because the sample paths in the future are a little bit higher than they should be you know, in expectation. Now you can base your decision on this. Yeah? So you know there is a region where I get a little bit more, but that little bit more that you get is the Monte Carlo error. So you can a little bit by your exercise strategy in your financial product, you can cash in the Monte Carlo error. So you have knowledge about the future because these random variables here, if they are Monte Carlo approximation, they are not completely pure FT1 measurable. There is a little bit noise from the future or put differently, the Monte Carlo error is actually not FT1 measurable. So you are optimizing among random variables, yeah, that have knowledge about the future and you get some, this is not perfect foresight, you do not see what is happening in the future, but you can, you have a little bit knowledge that there is an error going up in the future if you are in that position, or there's an error being biased low if you are in that position. And you can a little bit adopt your exercise strategy to uh, exercise if the error is in favor of you yeah, then you would exercise more often. So you can realize the biased sample pass in your favor. So it is more likely to exercise if the bias is paying to us yeah, instead if it is not paying to us. So we have a lower bound for the Bermudan option in theory, but we do not have the lower bound in the implementation. Because the, there is the Monte Carlo error, you can always estimate the Monte Carlo error, but this backward algorithm will make the error maybe larger, yeah, because you can uh, cash in the Monte Carlo error whenever you see the, the error. Yeah? So error, errors are not canceling. Yeah? Bias up, bias low, it's not canceling. The exercise strategy will try to filter this out. That said, you can remove this foresight bias. So the foresight bias removal, so how does it work? 
Yeah, the problem is if you go back, your decision here, your alpha star was estimated from stuff you saw in the future. And now you base your decision on this. So let's just estimate the alpha star with one Monte Carlo simulation. And then use an independent Monte Carlo simulation with the estimated alpha star. Yeah, alpha star is just telling you how much of each random variable you should use. So this has no nothing to do with the Monte Carlo simulation. Yeah, Choose that many units of S, that many units of S squared, and so on. So you estimate now the conditional expectation with an independent Monte Carlo simulation. So you, if there is an error in the alpha star, you cannot profit from the error because the alpha star times y has no longer this same bias. Yeah? So this is the idea. You have now two separate, uh, two independent Monte Carlo simulations. You use one to estimate the alpha star and you use the other to value your Bermusen using your exercise criteria. So I need basis functions y1 and continuation values u1, which will give me the estimate for the alpha star. And if I have that from the first Monte Carlo simulation, then I do a second Monte Carlo simulation, also simulating the same basis functions. Yeah? The meaning of the ve vectors of the random variables is the same. And of course, also the same financial product, so the same continuation values. And then I use the y2 with the previously estimated alpha star to get now the approximation of the conditional expectation. So I represent the conditional expectation on the U2 by yeah, X superscript two times alpha star superscript one. Yeah? So if you would like to write this again in this other notation, what we do is I multiply x with the columns from the second uh, Monte Carlo simulation. I multiply this with my alpha star, but my alpha star is now the x transposed x inverse x transposed u. Right? So this is estimated with the u superscript one. This will remove this uh, foresight bias and then you have a true lower bound. You still have a Monte Carlo error, yeah, but uh, you do not have the Monte Carlo error in the decision. Yeah, let's conclude with a code session. So first I would like to show you our conditional expectation estimator. So study the class Monte Carlo conditional expectation estimator. So this is now in our library. So this is the repository and it is here in this package conditional expectation. So let's have a short look that you see, I just implement now this methodology. Yeah? So you find in Monte Carlo conditional expectation. You find an implementation of this interface, conditional expectation estimator. So a conditional expectation estimator is just a function that takes a random variable and returns a random variable. So this is the conditional expectation. And I now implement this with a given set of regression basis functions. Okay regression basis functions. So you pass the regression basis functions. These are your y's, you pass them in the constructor. And how do we estimate the, I'm sorry. 
how do we estimate the condition expectation? First step is I calculate the alpha star. The alpha star, okay, so here it is called little x, is the solution x transposed x alpha star equals x transposed y. So the y is what was on my slide, the u. So these are the dependent variables, which I would like to predict now. So I calculate these parameters. So the x transposed x is formed here. So this is just basis function i, scalar product with basis function j. So x transposed x is just the scalar products of each of these basis functions. The matrix is symmetric. So I build this matrix x transposed x. Then I use a library. This is Apache Common Mass that has a solver that allows me to solve this equation. Actually, I use singular value decomposition, which allows to find a solution even if x transposed x is not invertible. So a generalized inverse. Yeah, that, this is the left-hand side of my linear equation. Then I built the right-hand side. The right-hand side is x transposed y. Yeah. So this is just the scalar product of my argument here, the guy of which I would like to calculate the condition expectation with each basis function. Yeah. So this is the scalar product of these guys. Then I solve this linear equation yeah, and I get my alpha. So this is my linear regression parameters. So then my conditional expectation is calculate for the given argument, the alpha star, okay? And then use your predictor basis functions, use your predictor basis functions and take the sum yeah, over alpha star i times y i, yeah? So over your basis function i multiplied with the con conditional expectation parameter alpha star i. Yeah? Take, the, take the sum of these. This is your conditional expectation. You see there is a small subtle thing. The first part is done with basis function estimator x transposed x. Yeah? This is done with the estimator basis functions. This is done with the predictor basis functions. So this is if you like to remove the foresight bias, you could use this conditional expectation estimator with, with two different sample sets of basis uh, functions, yeah, generated by different Monte Carlo simulations. Okay, so second uh, code session, second numerical experiment. Now study the Bermuden option implementation so this is now my backward algorithm. Together with the regression, yeah, the x transposed x inverse, x transposed u, the regression estimate for the condition expectation. So this guy has another method, the doodle method, with which we will do in the next session. So just look here at the conditional expectation estimator. And maybe then, experiment a little bit with this Bermuden. So I have a Bermuden option experiment here in this experiment repository. So let's look in this experiment. So this is the experiment I have used in the beginning. Okay, and let's look at the code, what I'm doing. So we use Black-Schultz model the time discretization for our Euler scheme for the SDE, yeah, five years annual time steps, the Monte Carlo simulation parameters, 5,000 sample paths with some Monte Carlo seeds. I create my Black Scholz model, my Brownian motion. I pass this to the Euler scheme to generate the Monte Carlo simulation of the time discrete stochastic process. The Bermuden option I would like to consider has just two exercise dates. So very simple, but you can generalize this if you like to play with this a bit. Yeah? So you can just add more times here. It has two exercise dates, T1, T2. T1 is in two years. T2 is in maturity. Maturity was five years. The strike 
is actually just the forward, so initial value times e to the RT, at least for the five-year maturity, for the two-year maturity, yeah, it's 80% of that. You know, so the strikes are a bit off. Then I create my Bermudan option and I plot a few, or print a, print a little bit information and I plot a few things. So before we look at the stuff we plot, let's have a look at my Bermudan option. So I initialize here the Bermudan option with the parameter estimate conditional expectation. So this is the regression method. There is a parameter number of basis functions and there is a parameter u spinning, yes or no. These parameters I pass here, number of basis function, u spinning, and I'm trying different number of basis functions, one, two, four, five, ten, and also different versions, yeah, without binning and with binning. Without binning, I will explain now what it is if we look into the Bermudan option. So now let's study the implementation of the Bermudan option. So the constructor of the Bermudan option has exercise dates, notionals, and strikes. It's this payoff here at every time. You know? So like we have in the previous session, also in the example, I can choose different exercise methods. Actually, there is a the lower bound method, our regression conditional expectation estimator. There's also an upper bound method, which we will study in a different session. Okay, so now comes the backward algorithm. I loop backward over time. I fetch all the properties of the product. This is the value of my underlying. And you see now the code is very short. Yeah, So I build my regression basis functions. I pass this to my Monte Carlo conditional expectation estimator. Okay. And then my Monte Carlo conditional ex expectation estimator is applied to the random variable u. So this is the random variable u. The random variable u, which is initialized to zero in the beginning and which is updated here according to my backward algorithm. So the new value of u is my exercise criteria, positive or negative. Then it is the random variable u again, or it is the exercise value. The exercise value is my underlying. Oh, sorry, here. Yeah, the exercise value is my my underlying, yeah, so my underlying s minus k times n divided by the numeria. And you also see that we use the conditional expectation estimator here only in the exercise criteria. Let me just finish now with showing you the plots that we do. So what are the regression basis functions we use? So the Bermudan option here uses two different versions of regression basis functions. If the Boolean u spinning is true, I will use just indicator functions. Yeah? So these guys here are just building the bins and they build indicator functions. So you see it's either one or it's either zero. If binning is false, I will use a polynomial in the stock. Yeah, One s, s squared, s to the power of three. So I will use a smooth function. Okay, so now try with these settings, this little experiment. Okay, so you see when you use just a single basis function, yeah, maybe the value of the Bermudan is not so bad, it should be maximized. Actually, with two basis functions, it's worse. But then four basis functions is improving it. Five basis functions, no longer improving it. 10 basis functions, it's actually getting worse. So choosing many basis functions is not giving you 
the best, yeah, the maximum, I would like to maximize this value, the maximum value. Yeah, with bins, yeah, it's a bit different. Using more bins improves the result. Yeah, But here we have also a high, high Monte Carlo error, high error. This also generates these plots. Okay, so you see with 100 bins, it's actually just noise you get. It's a piecewise constant function, but the piecewise constant function is very noisy. With 20 bins, it's the example we had, which I annotated in the script, looks a bit better. With 10 bins, the noise is going away, but my piecewise constant function is very coarse. Huh? So maybe I make a big mistake here huh, that I have the wrong decision. Now going to the polynomials. If you have a polynomial up to order, yeah, up, if I have just 10 monomials, so I have a polynomial up to order nine, yeah, then you see I have a huge overfitting. Actually, I would like to have a good estimate for this intersection point, which I don't get here. Also with five monomials, yeah, maybe, yeah, I still make an error. Okay, this five monomials is already quite okay. But if you look at four, it's actually a very nice fit of the queen line. The queen line being the analytic solution, the Black Schultz formula. This is the exercise point I would like to meet. This is the one that I get. Just a linear function, two basis function, one and S. Uh, not so bad, yeah, but okay, the figure with yeah, the figure with four basis functions is maybe, maybe, maybe a nice one. So you see choosing the right basis functions maybe also an art, and you have to check a little bit your results. That was it for today. And we will do the dual method, the upper bound method in the next session. Thank you.